youth, cars, and weapons. It's a deadly and heartbreaking mix, imperiling the lives of two young women crushed between vans. And a teen hockey player slips into a coma, his car T-boned at highway speeds. The worst news any mother could get. And knife-wielding, quick-tempered teens put 17-year-old Andrew's life on the line, all for a few beers. They did this for beer? Yeah. No, you just worry about your kids. Violent crime in youth may be on the rise, but nearly 50% of all youth traumas come from car crashes, the result of bad judgments made in split seconds. There's a thousand traumas a year. 80% um, of them are blunt trauma, which means car crashes and falls, um, and pedestrians hit by cars. It, it's sad when these kids come in with severe injuries that you know could have been prevented. Two young women who have fallen into that 80% category are rushed by EMS to Sunnybrook's Regional Trauma Center in Toronto. There's another one coming in, but she was the driver of the van. There's two vans there on scene. They were in the median. She was found face down on the ground. She just wrapped in towels just to make sure the bleeding was stopped. Get some uh, yeah, the other ones. Yeah. I know, honey, I know. We're gonna fix that. Co-workers in event planning, Brenda and Rhiannon's van spun out after hitting a patch of black ice. Then a fateful decision may now change their lives forever. Thinking they were safe, they got out of their van, only to be hit by another van, spinning out on the same patch of ice. Crushed between the two vans, Brenda's leg is now nearly severed. You know, it was a massive uh, injury to her leg. The muscle is ripped off the bone. The, the, the leg is mangled, almost amputated, and, and the chances of fixing that are, are pretty, pretty low in this case. How's it going, guys? Let's get the airway first. Trauma team leader and trauma program chief Dr. Fred Brenneman arrives just as Rhiannon is rushed in. Yeah. She was ejected, uh, unknown, uh, found laying under the van. She. Uh, does have a complete amputation of her left lower leg. Anybody have another pair of these? Compound fracture of her right knee, right mid shaft, tip fib, and right ankle. Um, she is alert to person, but not place or time. No obvious head trauma. This is her leg. You know, there's always a consideration, um, can we put it back on or not? And I have to say that in trauma, it's quite rare to be in that scenario because uh, it's usually, the amputated extremity uh, is usually very badly damaged. What's your first name? Rhiannon. how old are you? 20. You're in Sunny Brook in the trauma unit. Remember what happened? Do you remember what happened? No. You were in a car accident. You know that? You were in a car accident? Yeah, did you know that? No. It's a heartbreaking scenario, one this trauma center has seen too often. With 10% of traumas leading to death, it forces doctors to break terrible news to families that their child's not coming home. Suppose this patient does not make it. You have to actually now go to the family that's waiting in a family room and break some bad news to them. Uh, that's about the lowest point you could be at emotionally. It's a scenario that's caused the trauma center to start an unusual program, one called PARTY, which stands for Preventing Alcohol and Risk-Related Trauma in Youth. Today I'm uh, actually, overall in the day, I'm working in the burn unit today, but I'm stopping down and I'm gonna go to the trauma room and speak to some high school kids actually. So twice a week as part of the PARTY program, high school kids come to Sunnybrook to uh, sort of learn about prevention of trauma and uh, you know, they get a tour of different places in the hospital. It's going to be a very educational experience. We're just going to learn some uh, real life uh, experience, like how people went through accidents. And there's a couple people from our school that have been through uh, 
some serious accidents. It's be quite interesting. The big thing about trauma, we do a lot of work here. We treat the trauma patients, but a lot of it is preventable. And so if we can get people at a young age and teach them some things to try to prevent these traumas, then that, that would be the best treatment of all. And what we want to impart to you is that you need to make good choices. The person who has a choice to make, he made a choice to drink and drive. His choice led to making life choices for three other people. He crossed center line driving home, um, hit a vehicle head on, killed two young ladies in the front, and a uh, young lady in the back suffered severe burns to most of her body, okay? So I'm gonna show you her video. This is a picture of me before I was hit by a drunk driver, before two of my friends died. This is me when my life was just like anyone else in college. This is me after being hit by a drunk driver. I think it has to make a difference. You see it, and you see it from their reactions. But they've even studied it, and studied the 10 years of the party program, and shown that kids that go through the party program have much lesser uh, incidents than people who don't ever get exposed to it. While teens are shocked into thinking straight in one room, Brenda lies unconscious, her right leg barely intact, as the team struggles to stabilize blood loss that could be catastrophic. Pouring out where? Gotta put the tourniquet just above the thigh. So when someone comes in with an extremity amputation, the first concern is bleeding because, you know, there's a usually large vessel that supplies the extremity, in this case the leg, and uh, if it's not clotted off, you can have some significant bleeding, so our first concern is always bleeding. Can I get some blood? She also was sicker um, because of her other injuries. Uh, she had uh, a bit of a head injury. The combination of massive blood loss and brain injury is one of the worst scenarios, signaling a drastic loss of oxygen to the brain, potentially starving it to death. One team battles to stabilize Brenda, while another works on Rhiannon to prep her for surgery, her left leg already gone and remaining tissue at high risk of infection. But the team is worried about her right leg, badly mangled. She could lose that one too. And there's good reason why. They can't detect any blood flow to the leg. And obviously it's pretty important for her to keep that extremity because she's already lost one leg. So we were looking for a pulse and, um, and hoping that she had enough blood supply that that leg would survive really makes you think about things like, you know, you get a flat on the side of the road, what do you do? Do you get out of the vehicle when, you know, is it something you do? And it's just, it's an unconscious thought until you see something like this. Nobody ever thinks that this is going to happen to them. And you can well imagine these two young girls definitely didn't. The team has to work fast now to restore a pulse. Can the surgeon save this young woman's remaining limb in time? Toronto's Sunnybrook Regional Trauma Center believes most, if not all, traumas are avoidable, particularly those involving youth. One false move or bad decision is all it takes to plunge life and limb into peril. Less than an hour ago, co-workers Rhiannon and Brenda found themselves crushed between vehicles after getting out of their van 20 feet from the roadside. 22-year-old Rhiannon lost her left leg at the scene, but she doesn't know it yet. What do you mean? Your legs are broken. I doubt what? it. I doubt it. All she knows is that she's broken her right leg. She could lose it if vascular surgeons can't restore blood flow fast. She didn't know what was going on, so repeated questions about what had happened, where she was, where her girlfriend was, who she didn't realize was in the room with her. The only thing we could do at that point was try and console her within the moment because two minutes later she didn't recall, she didn't realize that she had been struck by a car, didn't know, you know, really why she was here. The last thing the team wants is to traumatize Rhiannon further with news of her severed limb. Their focus now is on getting her to surgery in 20 minutes, or she could face life in a wheelchair. So my leg's broken? Yeah. I've never had a broken bone before in my body. Jam, we had a tennis
Meanwhile, Brenda lies unconscious, her own right leg barely intact, as the team struggles to stabilize blood loss that could be catastrophic, sending her into shock or a heart attack. Rhiannon's pain may be excruciating, but she's worried about her friend. Is Brenda okay? I don't know. I'll tell you as soon as we find something out. But Brenda is not okay. What's going on? Her heroin pressures are high. I'm just going to have another list to make sure I'm not down one long way. She can't breathe on her own. She's on a respirator, and her airway is still not easily taking oxygen into her body and brain. When someone's airway pressure is high, in this scenario, the thing that we are most concerned about is whether or not they've got a pneumothorax or a punctured lung. And uh, that can be a life-threatening injury. So it's one of the sort of triggers for us to make sure that that's not the situation. Finally, Brenda's bleeding is under control. Tourniquets and medication have stabilized her enough for Dr. Brenneman to make his next move. CT or or. Both women need surgery fast. But for Brenda, that won't be easy. Her leg is at near certain risk of amputation. But that's not what concerns this team. A CT is ordered to rule out brain damage. Rhiannon is about to be prepped for OR, often a time when parents are allowed a brief visit, but not for this young woman. Bring them in. No, he can't bring them in. He can't bring them in. Dr. Brenneman has to prepare them first before he can let them see their daughter in this state. Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center's trauma intervention program with youth takes them through the paces of trauma, shocking them with the truth of what's actually involved. They're here for the whole day. I just sort of pop in here for 10, 15 minutes and sort of they get to see somebody who's part of this trauma team. And uh, I, I love it. I actually stop what I'm doing, make sure I'm here uh, for that. Basically, uh, I try to set the, set the scenario for like what happens when a trauma patient comes in and uh, you know how many people are, are working there and how many people it takes to, to make a trauma resuscitation happen. So this is the trauma room. Like there's two beds in the trauma bay. So at one time, ideally, you can't have more than two. It's a very busy place. We have about 1,000 or so traumas per year in here. So it's kind of nonstop, you know, three to four a day on average, but some days we'll have 10, other days we'll have one or two. Uh, does it leave an impact on you after you've done, you know, a surgery or anything like that? How do you eat? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what bothers me is the uh, emotional side of it, you know. I mean, you're never ready to go tell a young couple that their 16-year-old daughter didn't make it, you know, and that you worked on them. So that definitely leaves an impact on you. Um, out of all the cases you have in the trauma unit, um, like, how many people are able to survive? Good question. So let's say we have 1,000 traumas a year. So our survival rate is about 90%. Car crashes are the number one cause of teenage deaths. And young Ryan is hovering dangerously close to being in the 10% that don't make it. This is an 18-year-old male driver, seatbelted, MBC. Uh, highway speed, car is uh, found on its side, cut into a rock cut, totally demolished. A teen driver ran a stop sign and T-boned Ryan at an intersection as he was driving home from hockey practice. It's the worst news any mother could get. Then I got the news that he was being airlifted to Sunnybrook, so I knew it was bad. The patient was initially found with a GCS of 12. Vital um, signs were stable, uh, complaining of ankle pain. Uh, on our arrival, he deteriorated, and since then, he has been a GCS of 3. Ryan um, has slipped into a coma. His GCS, or Glasgow Coma Scale rating, has gone from a 12 to a 3. It means his brain is shutting down. But how irreversibly is unknown. Generally speaking, the lower score, uh, the greater chance of further neurologic problems or even death. This people was reacted uh, to on our arrival, now it's pinpoint. Were well, you moving everything? Yeah, yeah, he was quite combative. Oh, yeah, he, was he kept trying to pull out his IVs and grab at his hand. Oh, yeah, oh, Ryan is Dr. Brzezowski's third trauma patient in a room equipped only for two. And then, more bad news. He takes a call from EMS. Right now, I have three patients in my trauma. How can I refuse this? Sunnybrook has Canada's largest and leading trauma center. Dr. Brzezowski can't say no. Um, what's wrong with this one? So another trauma victim is en route. With three patients already under his care, a fourth one will push the team here beyond peak capacity. I told them we just got three in a row. There's one in the acute room that we're gonna bring in here. Ryan needs an immediate CAT scan of his brain. But before that can happen, 
There's more trouble. Well, we need the doctor first. They can't find a pulse on Ryan's foot, and he's got an open fracture. It's a double risk. That could mean removing the leg to save Ryan's life. But orthopedics is also busy with other trauma patients, so all Dr. Przowski can do is prep Ryan's open fracture and hope to restore the blood flow. With Ryan in a coma, it may already be too late. Car crashes are the number one cause of teen deaths. 10% don't make it, and one hovering dangerously close to that 10% range is 18-year-old Ryan. Um, car was uh, found on its side, cut into a rock hut, totally demolished. He's arrived at Sunnybrook's Regional Trauma Center in Toronto in a coma, the result of a brain injury. How bad it is remains a question the team's about to answer from a CT scan. T-boned in his truck at highway speeds by another young driver, the team knows this much, that Ryan's prognosis is very poor. Neurosurgery has been paged to look at Ryan's horrendous head injury. Bad choices made by youth often involve more than car crashes. They're the result, too, of the dangerous mix of hot tempers and weapons. And sometimes it's an argument over the smallest thing that can cost a teen their life. 17-year-old Andrew arrives at Sunnybrook's Regional Trauma Center in Toronto, a victim of a posse of ill-tempered teens. Oh, it's Andrew, 17 years old. Had a little altercation tonight with uh, well, six gentlemen at the park. He got with stuck. friends in a park, having a few beers, Andrew and the group were approached by party crashers who demanded their beer. But Andrew stood up to them. He got stabbed four times and paid an unforgettable price. It was about a five-inch knife, so it's all entry wounds, no, no accidents. Oh, it's good. Oh, one, this two. one, the worst one. Okay, one, two, and... One, two, three. Three, and one, two, four. Four, four. Yep. Stab wounds, one, two, three on the back, four on the leg. Yep. Small blade, five inches, hemodynamically stable in transports. Um, six assailants. Did you deep breath Where's the fourth? One on the back? One on the back, one on the leg, right here. With any stabbing victim, trauma team leader Talat Chugtai is on the lookout for a massive internal bleed that could escalate out of the team's control. Does that hurt? Does this hurt? I'm pressing, yeah? Well, I'm pressing, yeah? yeah. Well, basically, whenever you have anything irritating the lining of the abdominal cavity, such as blood or contents from the intestinal tract, gastrointestinal tract, it irritates the lining, and that causes you to have pain when you press down. OK, you having trouble breathing? It's in pitch shorter. It's right there. But Dr. Chugtai is stressed. He's had to give bad news on his shift, and he's just seen too many youth teen traumas tonight. Stop. Hey, listen, I'm deciding what you need. You need an operation. What do you have? All these wounds. Do they go inside? Did they hit your spleen, your liver, your stomach, your lungs? Okay, needs a stack chest x ray, please. X ray here? Yeah. Stack chest. X ray. Let's roll them off the board first. One, two, three. That's the back one? Yeah. yeah. So it's chest. So we might have a pneumo. A pneumo. It's a collapsed lung. Andrew may need a chest tube. It just decreases your bilateral. I couldn't hear it. How old are you? 17, huh? So. What happened? Uh, some guys in the park surrounded us, and they tried to take, like, whatever like, beer we had. Whatever what? Beer. Yeah. Beer. They did this for beer? Yeah. And then I just told the guy, come on, let's like, leave us. And then he got all excited, pulled out a knife, and then okay. it stuck me. So don't take anybody on these days. It's a dangerous world. Yeah. Stab wounds. Two of them are to the chest. One of them is to the abdomen. One of them is to the leg. The chest, we'll see if he has a collapsed lung, see if he needs a chest tube. The abdomen, he needs to go to the operating room. It's gone through the abdominal wall into the abdomen. So we have to open him up to make sure to see what's injured. Andrew's x-ray gives a first glimpse of the internal damage. This one looks deep. Okay, 
Chest is negative, no need for a chest tube, there's no, it didn't no, hit the lung. No, we're gonna find bleeding in the lung. Yeah, exactly. But we have to open his abdomen whenever the OR is ready. Okay. Okay. It's traumas like Andrew's that the hospital tries to prevent with their youth intervention program. Coming into the trauma room, even though it's it's empty, I mean we've got an empty stretcher. Um, we really try to relay to the uh, to the students what actually goes on when you arrive. That we do cut off all your clothes. That you have, um, you know, a, a group of uh, healthcare professionals probing and prodding you. That your dignity is really checked at the door because now um, you're exposed, um, and basically they're trying to save your life. You're going to get a tube in your penis as well. It's going to go into your bladder. Yeah. Is it painful? It's uncomfortable, I'm not gonna lie to you. All because of a split second of a bad choice you made or someone else made can determine whether you're gonna survive um, and or succumb to your injuries. Meanwhile, another teen fights for his life. 18-year-old Ryan is in a coma the result of a possible inoperable brain injury. T-boned in his truck at highway speeds by a young driver, Ryan's prognosis is very poor. Neurosurgery has now arrived to examine Ryan's CT scan, and it's not good. Ryan's skull is fractured, but it's worse than that. A part of his brain is actually herniated outside the fracture. And he's got a pneumocephalus, a likely inoperable bruising and deep bleed in the brain. Trauma team leader Dr. Mike Brzozowski is in the trauma room with two other patients when the CT scan is ready to view. It's a bit unusual in that most injuries are closed head injuries where the skull is intact or fractured, but in this case it was exceptional because the brain matter was actually coming through a fracture in the skull. That's a, a very bad prognostic factor. And, and the deeper the bleed, it's usually a worse situation. So um, it would cause more damage to go in through the normal brain tissue to evacuate that bleed. So in some cases, the, the neurosurgeon's hands are tied in that they would do more harm in trying to fix the bleeding rather than uh, going after it. So in this case, there was, uh, there was some bleeding that was not uh, amenable to a surgery. We're very concerned and, and very guarded in our, in our prognosis and in our discussion with the family. The fracture might be repairable, but brain damage is nearly certain. Dr. Przowski is compelled now to do what he dreads. He'll have to tell Ryan's parents about the likely fate of their son. Youth making split-second decisions in cars often leads to tragic results. Deep in a coma, 18-year-old Ryan undergoes brain surgery to repair herniated tissue, protruding from a fractured skull, all the result of a T-bone crash. Having brain exposed at the time of injuries is a very poor prognostic marker, and I really didn't think he was going to live for survive his injuries. His parents have been told to expect the worst, that he might not make it through the surgery. And if he does, there's no guarantee he'll awaken from his coma. Co-workers Brenda and Brianna are destined to leave the trauma room. Brenda will be off to CT scan, and Rhiannon will be prepped for surgery, both the victims of a fateful decision that had them nearly crushed between two vehicles. They wouldn't let me see her because they were stabilizing her, and then the doctor came in. It seemed like forever, but I don't think it was that long. And he came in and told me that she had lost her left leg. And that's all I remember. When I saw her, her eyes were taped shut. And she had blood coming out of her ears. And they just said, talk to her. And um, then I remember running down to the elevator with her. And then they took her into surgery. We're trying desperately to save her right leg. And uh, she's had a, a, a bad fracture where the bone has come through the skin and uh, 
called an open fracture, but not only that, she's had a vascular injury there as well. And the amputation rate with a vascular injury and an open fracture is very high. To save the leg, vascular surgeons have got to restore blood flow by repairing nearly severed arteries. Failure here means full amputation. Our concern is that she, uh, you know, retains that right leg because that's, you know, going to make a big difference to her. If she loses that leg, she's going to be uh, really confined to a chair and to very limited walking. Catastrophes that cost young lives come in many forms, and Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center's party program tries to fight one of them, getting at-risk youth to put their weapons down. Be smart about things. If someone stops you on the road and says they want your wallet, you give it to them. You know, if, uh, if you're hanging around with a crowd which you think uh, is a little bit risky and they're in the wrong, going to the wrong place, so it's not really where you live. You know, it's often you know, what crowd you end up with or whether you want to take on somebody, uh, these types of things get you. These are, I'm talking about the stab wounds and the gunshot wounds. When I started doing this probably 12 or 15 years ago, we saw so few uh, victims of penetrating trauma that it was not a, a great place to, to learn how to deal with gunshots and stab wounds, whereas now it's uh, you know, very common to get a stab wound or a gunshot here. Young kids walk around the streets with guns. It's absolutely ridiculous. There's always something that happens in a party. People start violence for no reason, you know? I've heard of somebody get stabbed over an orange peel, so... Oh. Young Andrew has learned the cost of those risks. He's bleeding from four stab wounds and has got to have exploratory surgery. Trauma surgeon Tala Chugtai is taking no chances. He needs to do a full exploration of Andrew's abdomen. He knows that scans and tests can't always reveal how bad the damage could really be. So we have a 17-year-old kid, I believe, who uh, was in the park and <clears throat> was uh, approached by some other kids. And whatever they had on their possession, they asked for. These kids, like I guess most kids would do, said, uh, I don't think so, we're not going to give you it, whatever we have. And so the others took offense to that, pulled out a knife, stabbed him four times, twice in the chest, once in the abdomen, once in the leg. The chest wound seemed to have missed the major structures, such as the, the lungs and the heart, but the abdominal wound has gone into the abdominal cavity. <clears throat> With that type of a wound, once it's gone through the abdominal cavity, we're not 100% sure whether what it's hit. Dr. Chugtai knows that the abdomen is like a black box, and only a painstaking examination can reveal if anything's being damaged. Here you can see the tract. Right? So it's obviously gone through. Nothing actively bleeding right now. But we'll see. This case is actually more difficult than the ones that are an obvious ruptured spleen or something like that, because this one is subtle. It may have just nicked a small part of the intestine somewhere, and we, we have to look for it very carefully. But the path seems to be like this. And we don't know that until we're inside. This guy went through the one on the back. This one in the back? Yeah. Really? I think. Oh, we have missed holes. Oh, no. To look for a small hole. We haven't fully explored the colon and the intestine yet, but uh, some hematoma, some blood staining around the colon. We're going to explore that to make sure there's no hole in the colon. There might be. So right here, it's gone through some of the omentum. And there are repairs he has to make. The omentum is torn, the fatty tissue covering abdominal structures. It's a protector that over time could have torn open, leaving organs painfully exposed to damage. Now we close this defect. Okay. Do you have a 3 old micro? A lot of work to say. 3 old micro? Sure. Lucky. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to irrigate and uh, close the stab wound from the inside, and that's it. Close. So no matter what scans we have, CT scans, the best ones, MRI, you cannot tell whether that colon is injured or not unless you do all of that work and uncover it and look at it and feel it. After a detailed repair, Dr. Chugtai is relieved. The past 24 hours has been uh, difficult. We've been telling families about uh, their 17-year-old uh, children uh, dying or their 30-year-old father probably not going to make it. That type of a case has uh, passed 24 hours, so this will be good to tell somebody that their, their child is doing fine and should recover from this. Stabbed four times, okay? Once in the chest, once in the back, once in the abdomen, and once in the leg, okay? So he's very lucky. In the end, we explored everything, didn't find anything that needed to be fixed. Now, just closing them up. Thank God. Yep. 
So it's okay. Yeah. He has a big scar. It's a big operation still. He doesn't know that he had nothing, right? The body still thinks that he's had a major yeah. operation. So he's just lucky that he... Lucky. Yeah. Very lucky. Any of these stab wounds, I don't need to tell you, could have hit the heart or the lungs and these are the types of things we see here that are very, very yeah. serious and often fatal. And, and this one could hit any number of the organs I told you in the yeah. abdomen. So, very lucky. Thank you very much. No really. Great Thank you. All Thank right. you. Thanks. Dr. Chugtai's words are what any parent wants to hear with a son or daughter in trauma, that their child has made it, that he's lucky. It's been 10 years since Sunnybrook's Health Sciences Center in Toronto started a critically needed program to shock teens with an inside look at the tragedy wrought by trauma, the majority of which involve youth 15 to 24 years old. I think they realize that people that are affected by trauma are people like them. You know, These are young kids, about 16 to 19, and these are the types of patients that we treat in the trauma, and they kind of realize that they all might know somebody who's involved in trauma, and. Uh, and they realize that it's real, it's serious, and that it can happen to anybody, including them. These teens may know it's real, but nothing prepares them for the emotional part, meeting trauma survivors like Brenda and Rhiannon, who each lost a leg in a devastating crash. They've survived their surgeries, but they still don't know if they'll have to live out the rest of their lives confined to wheelchairs. We're about 20 feet away from the road, so I figured we're safe to get out of the truck for two minutes. And we went to the back of the truck uh, to check out what was broken and what wasn't. And uh, that's the last thing that we remember. They cut my leg here, and Rhiannon's leg was um, severed on site. That's what it looks like right now. We can't do anything by ourselves anymore. And it's really, really hard. It's amazing how it actually affects you, yourself, your friends, your loved ones. And it's just, it's, it, it changes everybody's lives, not just your own. We both survived something very, very serious, as you can all just see for yourself. I'm here, I'm alive, so it was Brenda, and that's like the greatest thing in the world, so it's really crappy to be sitting in the hospital, but it's probably the greatest thing right now that I've ever, could ever feel, to be sitting here, to be alive. You guys don't realize how precious your life actually is. Do you go through something like this? Today, we just got a step closer to the people that have been through into like accidents and stuff like that, right? And then it was just really devastating to hear stories. And, you know, like, I was surprised that she was actually smiling too, you know? Like, I would be crying the whole time. So when I saw her smiling, I'm just like, well, you know, you have some, you're brave enough to smile when you're in bed like that. You can lose your life in just one second. Things just happen just like that. And you don't even expect it. You never even stop to consider that it can actually happen to you. Like, well, you know, you're not safe from anything. Anything can happen to you. Life goes on, and we're lucky that you guys are still here. But I gotta tell you, the people that work for this hospital, ambulance drivers, I don't know how these people get their strength and how they do what they do. I, I can't thank them enough. I don't have enough time in my life to thank them. I told all the doctors I want them to go home and thank their parents for bringing up such wonderful people <coughs> and so dedicated to helping others. Thank you. The women will have to wait for several weeks before learning whether they're suitable candidates to receive leg prostheses. Good luck, guys. Keep safe. Yeah, that positive attitude really helps everyone. It's been two months since Ryan arrived by air ambulance at Sunnybrook, the victim of a T-bone car accident while driving home from hockey practice. The worst 
part was most injuries are closed head injuries where the skull is intact or fractured, but in this case it was exceptional because the brain matter was actually coming through a fracture in the skull. Well, I really didn't think he was going to live for slight his injuries. However, despite his terrible head injury, the neurosurgeons were still able to um, take him to the operating room, clean up the wounds and, and remove any of the dead, the non-viable brain tissue, and then uh, you know wait and see what uh, the recovery was like. Miraculously, after being in a coma for nine days, Ryan emerged to face a long road of rehabilitation ahead. I don't remember anything from that night besides school. I don't remember coming back from hockey or hockey practice, but the only thing I remember is coming here and then doing the physiotherapy. We just think that uh, he's made such wonderful progress. Uh, the staff at Sunnybrook have been so supportive. Without them, I don't know how we would have made, I don't think I would have survived. It's the worst news any mother could get. Um, I'm an emergency room nurse, so I was trying to stay calm. But then I got the news that he was being airlifted to Sunnybrook, so I knew it was bad. And he's made a remarkable recovery. Grateful to Sunnybrook Hospital, Toronto Rehab. I never thought or dreamed I would be here today watching him walk. Um, certainly, the alternative was devastating. Ryan not only suffered brain injury, but a devastating fracture that needs extensive rehabilitation. Physically, when Ryan first arrived, he wasn't able to put any weight through his left leg because of those fractures. So Ryan has really worked hard over the past uh, few months. Ready? Better. Ryan will stay at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute for another month, unable to attend school or be with his friends, all the result of a young driver's inexperience. But so long as he keeps up the rigors of daily therapy, he might just make it. Nice work. Brenda and Rhiannon have been out of the hospital now for two months and into St. John's Rehabilitation Hospital. And still no definite word on whether they'll walk again. But that hasn't stopped them from working hard in the hopes that they will. Once the prosthetic leg comes, then I'll be walking in my four-inch stilettos. That's my goal, is to walk in my four-inch stilettos. I'm going for um, another x-ray for this leg because I'm only 40% uh, weight bearing, but I hope they can tell me at least 80 percent. Even if it's 80 percent, hey, that's better than 40, right? You do learn and realize that you know you, we take a lot of stuff for granted, and uh, now we're actually getting to uh, see that you know we got to slow down and smell the roses, as they say. I never thought I'd lose the leg, but here I am today, and so is Brenda, and it sucks but it's just a part of life and we're both here and I get my chance to, to walk again. But even if fitted with prosthetic legs, will these women be able to manage well enough to walk again? Violent crime is on the rise in the teen population across all major cities. It knows no street boundaries or social class, and it takes only one bad decision to change young lives forever. Like Andrews, weeks before and after delicate surgery, Andrews at home recuperating, the victim of a stabbing ambush by some school thugs, all for a few beers. I was in, I was in a class with a kid that did it. They charged him and stuff, but. Now he's just like under house arrest and already he's been seen around like pretty much off like scoffery so some part of me just wants me to like go up there and attack him but I just be kind of like stooping to his level so I just call him a coward for what he did and that's about it I walk away. So I'm more careful of like, like who I'm around I'm more I'm out I want to know where I am and like who's around me and stuff like that so. Yeah, probably more cautious. So I just don't think I'll ever get over this because I worry about him every time he goes out. And I don't know, I can't explain it, the feeling that I went through. And, you know, you just worry about your kids, you know, if they're going to be safe on that, so.
It's a month since Brenda's been struggling on her own in a wheelchair after a devastating car crash that cost her her right leg. Today, that may all change. I'm kind of nervous this morning. Excited and scared and everything all in one. It's still kind of iffy. Today, I guess we'll really find out if I have enough um, on the inside to sustain it and keep it on. And I'm not allowed to take it home, right? Now I'll take it home this weekend. This <laughs> weekend. <laughs> I'll just go for a long I told you that, yeah. So, as you know, it's going to be a little bit funny feeling at first. So it's going to be a bit low. It's weird saying two kittens. No, we're okay. I had to get used to just seeing one, and now it's neat seeing two. Anything uncomfortable? Nope. Once I get this mastered, I'll be training with Angela on how to use high heels. I can't wait. This is the ultimate goal. Yeah, high heels and driving. Why don't you try taking a step or two you can? Take a step forward. Now let that knee bend. There you go. Whoa! Yeah, it's transfer. Extend your, your left knee. There you go. Okay. Up nice and tall. Up nice and tall. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm proud of the work that I've done because I've worked really hard. And today was just the payoff because I actually finally got to stand on two feet. And it was really, really good. I'm really happy. And I know it's a lot more work ahead of me, but I'm ready to do it and I'm ready to fight for it because I want it. Yeah. There, there we go. go. That was a good one. That was a good one. It just looks nice to look down and see two shoes. Giving it back, say goodbye. No, I want to take it home. <laughs> I know you do. Three months after losing her left leg, it's now Rhiannon's turn to realize her dream of walking again. Before the accident, when I would see somebody in a wheelchair, I'm like, man, you know, it kind of sucks that they've, they're, they've, they're put in that position now, and, you know, sometimes they're not able to get back up onto their feet, two feet again. And I'm very lucky that I am able to get out from those wheels and stand on my own two feet, which, which is, makes a really big difference. Ready, Mom? Rhiannon's mom waits with anticipation as her daughter takes her first steps, reminiscent of a young child taking her first steps so long ago. Reminds me when you were Yeah, your eyes are getting ulterior. I know it's good. That's an awesome feeling, is to actually be on both feet again and actually being able to walk is probably like the greatest feeling that I've had in a long time, so that's, that's good. And I know my mom is very proud to okay. see me walk again. All right, okay. So I guess I would choose. Okay. We do take our legs for granted, and I have taken my legs for granted for sure. I've put them through a lot. So, I think it's better. There's always uh, an ending to your story, so hopefully it's a good one. And in my situation, it's, it's good. So. Rhiannon and Brenda are the lucky ones. Back at the trauma center, the work continues, trying to ensure youth who land in trauma have a fighting chance. We treat the trauma patients, but a lot of it is preventable. And so if we can get people at a young age and teach them some things to try to prevent these traumas, then that, that would be the best treatment of all. Um, I know a lot of kids who think this could never happen to you, this could never happen to me, but it shows you like ordinary people, it happens all the time, and it's scary. It could easily be any one of us, you know, in a wheelchair tomorrow. It just makes you think twice about what you do, what your actions, it makes you want to listen to that voice that they tell you, because it is true, you always get that. Yeah, I've never really thought about, you know, dying or death, but coming here, you, know, you never know what can happen. 